This is for Keeps, a podcast about collections and connections. I'm David Peterkovsky. Nostalgia can be powerful, and all kinds of things can trigger it. An old photograph, the smell of a certain perfume, and of course, songs from the past. And sometimes, it's truly the most mundane reminders of the past that get the nostalgia to really kick in. This story captures that phenomenon through an unexpected collection that's an admittedly odd time capsule of sorts. It's a collection that went viral, inspired the creation of new music, and gently jolted the memories of thousands and thousands of people who shopped at what was once one of America's biggest big box retailers. Hello, and welcome to Kmart. We're glad you're here. At Kmart, our associates are dedicated to serve you. If you need any assistance or just have a question, our associates would be glad to help you anytime. And as always, thank you for shopping Kmart. The collection in question consists of the very inoffensive audio you're hearing here. Dozens of cassette tapes that were played over the sound systems of Kmart department stores in the late 1980s and early 1990s. The tapes feature hit songs by a who's who of soft rock artists, including Richard Marks, Lionel Richie, and Anne Murray, as well as easy listening instrumental numbers, or so-called elevator music along with advertisements that would get the attention of Kmart shoppers and encourage them to check out the specials in the so-called savings store. And the man who assembled this unorthodox collection is Mark Davis, who lives in suburban Chicago and happily worked for Kmart from 1989 to 1999, starting at their store in Naperville, Illinois, when he was still a shaggy-haired teenager. Soon after his start at Kmart, Mark took an interest in the tapes, which the company's corporate office sent out monthly, and later weekly, for stores to play on repeat, at least until the in-store music began being delivered via satellite in the mid-90s. Once a tape went out of rotation at the store, Mark would keep it, eventually building up a collection of 56 cassettes. Years later, as a way to share his collection with anyone who might find it mildly interesting, Mark posted a video about the tapes on YouTube, and later he uploaded digital copies of the tapes to the Internet Archive website. But what should have been the end of the story was only the beginning. The collection got written up by MTV, and when other media outlets began reporting on Mark's curious collection of Kmart audio ephemera, it went viral. His YouTube views and digital downloads of the tapes went through the roof. He found himself chatting about the collection on national public radio and the Kmart tapes themselves began to get spliced, diced, and remixed by creators of a musical subgenre known as Vaporwave, which blends together samples of smooth jazz, R&B, and elevator music to poke nostalgic, gentle fun at consumer culture. Amazingly, as the number of Kmart locations was continuing its long decline, it seemed that Kmart itself was having a moment. And that's a big part of what makes Mark's collection so unique. By preserving and sharing the in-store audio, he's not just tapping into shoppers' nostalgia for the retail experience of yesteryear. He's also saving, pun intended, a bit of the history of Kmart, which went from being a retail discount powerhouse with nearly 2,500 stores globally to filing for bankruptcy in 2002, and has seen its U.S. store locations drop to just 24 and falling as of mid-2021. As a teenager... Working at Kmart was a stroke of luck for Mark, who was thrilled that the job would put him in close proximity to his classmates. I was 16 years old and uh, applied and got hired on the spot for a job at Kmart at uh, a very popular mall called the Ogden Mall, where a lot of my friends hung out with on weekends and such because there was a theater and such. So it was really a great place to be and high visibility because, as I said, that whole outdoor strip mall was like a hangout spot. So I kind of was in the action when people came in to buy candy and stuff and sneak it into the theater. And and, and it was just kind of nice being in the action. Saving the soundtrack to his job at Kmart was something he started soon after getting hired. 
and it was during a long shift on a holiday when he first got the idea to begin his collection. I'm a audio electronics type of guy, and I always found it really interesting to know how store sound systems were connected and what did the equipment look like. So I went behind the service desk and took a look, and there was a, a tape player there. And next to that tape player were a, was a small stack of cassette tapes. And I looked at them, and, you know, we were in the middle of November, and I'm seeing, okay, there's August, September, October, and I'm thinking, you know, I bet you these things just get thrown out, and, and there's probably no use for them, I, I guess, unless the one that you're playing gets clogged. But it was at the end of the month anyways. So I put the other tapes into my smock, in the pocket of in, in my Kmart smock. With his smock full of soft rock... Mark was well on his way to building the collection. But at this point, you may be wondering what a lot of people have wondered about Mark's tapes. Why keep those? Well, Mark has a clear answer. I took them for posterity, more or less, because I thought it would be interesting someday to listen to those tapes. Because as a kid, when you're working on a sales floor for eight hours at a time, and I, I used to work weekends and I'd work a couple nights, so I mean, we're talking 20, 22 hours a week, maybe. You actually get to know the music, whether you like it or not, it just kind of carries you through the day. Um, and so yeah, you get used to it. You may even kind of like it a little bit. So I'm like, you know, let me keep these tapes. Someday they may be interesting. Plus, it's just kind of fascinating to have, you know, a piece of Kmart because this is my first job. Mark enjoyed working for the company and never could bring himself to let the tapes go into the trash. Over time, Mark went from the floor of the Naperville store to climbing the Kmart ladder, so to speak. I ended up going into the management program after college and then was at various Kmarts throughout the Chicagoland area. But the cassettes era, and when I was taking these cassettes, it was all at this store and when I was a, an hourly associate. So much different times. And, uh, you know, it was just something that I found interesting, and I kept taking those tapes because I just felt the need to continue collecting them, and I felt like they were just going to be thrown out, which it turns out I discovered they were. I mean, there was no formal policy as to what to do with them. If there was a policy, it was to destroy them because you wouldn't send back a cassette that has flipped and, and completely gone on auto reverse 12 to 14 times a day, not to mention over the course of 30 days, how many times that tape had been played. So they're garbage and they're worn down. So I just kept going. Eventually, word got out among Mark's co-workers about his taking of the tapes, and that's when he got a little help in his quest. I got to know people working there, and the people working the service desk knew I did that, and so they actually saved those tapes for me. I made a point of saying, don't throw them out. And then when I subsequently went away to college between 1992 and 1996, and I came back to work seasonally, as well as every couple weekends I'd come back because I was able to stay on the payroll. They were very flexible and good to me. I had the people keep the tapes then. So I, I really had an easy way of getting this collection, and that's how it amassed to the size that it is. Uh-huh. And I want to ask you, you mentioned that you heard these tapes multiple times a day. Do you have any idea how many times you heard a typical cassette? Well, you know, if you do the math, uh, you know, it probably played probably about 10 times in its entirety over the course of a day. So these tapes, working four weekends a month and a couple nights each week, I, I'm sure I heard them dozens of times. But, but also, they were very muffled. The audio was very low. And so you didn't always really hear it, but it was there. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, you, you, you'd hear the music clearly like you do in a retail store today. But it was there, and you got to hear it. And so, yeah, I got to know it. And so did the people I work with, because we would joke at some of the, the, the goofy songs or the ones that were kind of like elevator-type music, that sort of thing. And you mentioned that you kind of liked some of the songs. What's the rough ratio of like to dislike? <laughs> Good question. It, it's probably, I'd say about 25%. And I'm a music collector. And even back to when I was, you know, seven years old, I was really into different types of music. So I always had an appreciation for various genres. So just because something was instrumental, or at the time it was a John Denver song, or something that was a little bit more contemporary when I was listening to hair metal, because I had long hair. I had 12 inches of long hair, and I was kind of a metalhead um, into the whole metal MTV headbangers ball scene. I still had an appreciation, and I didn't criticize the music. So you do just kind of get used to it, and you know, you, you may tap your toe a little like it as well. Uh-huh. And did it ever feel like you were doing something wrong by taking them? No, I didn't feel it was wrong just because of the fact that there was no future use for them, and some of it was just 
it was obvious. And then also the people at the service desk who I talked to. And um, I don't think our managers ever knew. It wasn't something everybody knew about. In fact, very few people even knew I did it. It's just a couple of the key people that were full-timers, they knew to keep the tapes from Mark. So they'd put them in a separate spot in a cabinet tucked away or behind the sound system. Gotcha. So let's fast forward, pun completely intended, to around 2015 when you got the idea to post digitized versions of the tapes. What made you want to do that? So here's how it goes. I have a YouTube channel and I have a bunch of kind of oddball, goofy videos um, and collections and things that I am interested in. So I opened up and started a YouTube channel, actually probably more like around 2011 or 12, but it was around 2015 and I made a YouTube video of those cassettes. I took the box, I took a cassette recorder and a pair of just basic speakers, and on my workbench where I work on electronics, I wired it up, and I just used a handheld camcorder at the time, and I walked through the collection, the story, some of the trivia and information about it, and that video, which is approximately 10 minutes, started gaining a lot of traction on YouTube. I mean, like a lot of traction to the point where there were people that were liking it. And, you know, you start seeing likes, you start seeing views go up. Meanwhile, I had these other videos that were just a couple hits or nothing remarkable. But it was gaining traction. And some of the people were saying, can you digitize these? Can you get me a copy? I would love to have one. Some were even telling me, I'd love to have, you know, June of 1991, because that's the week I was born or, or, or something happened. So what I did is I digitized on my computer a couple tapes, and I put them in MP3 format, and I actually put them on a, a local server I have that is open to the web, and I gave the link to people to download, then I turned off the download link. And what's interesting is the people who were able to download those tapes, they passed the link around while it was active, and I guess a whole bunch of people got them. And there's just lots of chatter and discussion as well as private messages through YouTube saying, can you do more of this? It took about a year for Mark's YouTube video to get traction. Once it did, Mark got motivated to digitize and share more of the tapes, but it raised a number of questions. I digitized the entire collection, and it probably took me a couple months, just starting a tape, fast-forwarding into it, checking the recording levels to make sure that they're peaked properly, because sometimes the first you know, side A is recorded differently than side B. So I did that over the course of time, saved them as MP3, the highest quality that I could, but I didn't know what to do with those recordings because I'm, I'm thinking to myself, okay, it's a very interesting collection. There's definitely people interested, but what, where do I put these that will not get me in trouble with copyright and also get me in trouble with Kmart? Because I think the writing was on the wall that they were having trouble, but I'm thinking, okay, yeah, they're still alive and well. You know, maybe this is something I shouldn't do. Along the way... Someone suggested to Mark that he post the digitized tapes on the Internet Archive, an online library providing free access to all kinds of digitized materials, audio included. So I reached out to the Internet Archive and um, sent an email and said, you know, I have this collection. Um, I'd like to preserve it. I'd like to put it out there. And I, I got a kind of a generic response back. And it was just a generic form saying, thank you for your inquiry. We can't give you recommendations, but what we can tell you is you can upload it, this and that. And so I, th I thought to myself, well, they're not telling me not to. And there's tons of copyrighted content. So I just uploaded them. I uploaded all of them. And it took maybe two days. And what's funny is the guys at the Internet Archive, they actually created like a channel there. And they took the text that was on my YouTube video. So I think there actually was a crossover between people at the Internet Archive knowing about this or someone tipped them off or somebody had mentioned, go to the Internet Archive on YouTube. And that's what I did. So anyways, I uploaded those cassettes. They create a, a basic page with a picture of one of the tapes and then also the description as it was on YouTube. So I'm like, wow, someone actually put a template and, and put these in here for me. And then at that point, they were out there. And I sent a couple messages to the YouTube group, which is really the primary medium, because I wasn't using Reddit, I wasn't using Quora, Dig, any other things at the time. But I kind of let it out and I said, here's the channel they set up. And then it blew up from there. Like, really big. How big? As Mark recalls, once the tapes went viral, they actually interrupted a bit of family time. I remember I was at my in-law's house. It was, uh, I think it was in October or September 2015. And uh, on my news feed, I actually had an MTV article 
where MTV talked about the cassettes. And I, I remember thinking to myself, I said, wow, I mean, MTV isn't anything one that I remember to be growing up. But the fact that they covered it was kind of interesting. And I said to myself, you know, this may actually get some interesting traction. And sure enough, the YouTube hits went up because there was a link to it. And then it was like a week after that, and days after actually, where all sorts of media outlets were covering the story. The Daily Dot, Vice, just all sorts of news outlets. Mark Davis recently uploaded his hoard to archive.org, and he joins me now. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. And can you just tell us, where did these tapes come from? Okay, so it was my first job, and I was working for Kmart, and I was on the sales floor. And so that's when it really blew up, and I really started seeing a lot of hits on this. And then, at the time, able to search Google by my name, or Kmart cassettes, and I was starting to get hits and links all over the place. Yeah. And natural follow-up question. Your phone is blowing up. You're at your in-law's house. Do you turn to your mother-in-law and explain all this to her? I did. And I explained it to my wife. And what's funny is they didn't quite get it. In fact, my wife will say she doesn't quite get it today even. She'll say, why? But what's so interesting about these? But yeah, they were just kind of surprised. And I said, you know, we'll have to see where this goes. But hey, I kind of did something on the internet without even asking for it. <laughs> and maybe I kind of made my dent or, or, or started something viral without even intentionally trying to do so. While Mark got a lot of media attention for his collection of old Kmart tapes, not all of it was positive. Among all the coverage you got once it went viral, there was a bit of snark in some of the coverage, wasn't there? There was. One of the articles said some guy collected 56 hours worth of Kmart music for some reason. Um, another one just kind of made fun of the fact that why would you want elevator music, this sort of thing. I forget which, it may have been Esquire, actually, and it's, you know, Esquire online. But Esquire goes, um, <laughs> Aurora Man <laughs> fulfilling Internet's needs with stolen Kmart music or Muzak. And I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, that's actually really funny. I didn't take offense to any of it because I'm like, I don't know where this is going. And quite frankly, the types of collections and things I do and, and the whole idea was just to be kind of silly anyways, you know. I just figured, you know, maybe some people would be interested and someday it'd be fun. But I, I actually kind of enjoyed the fact that people made fun of it. And that's when I started getting a number of inquiries for interviews and it was difficult to keep up with, actually. I was getting notifications all over the place on different places and... Then these in-person interviews were requested, or via phone. So this might be a strange question, but do you have a favorite attribute of the tapes? I mean, are, you're not especially a connoisseur of this music, and maybe it's the advertising that appeals to you. What, what Can you put into words what it is about the tapes that you especially like? So I like the advertising. I'm a fan of nostalgia, and a lot of my friends will tell you and it's evident for the collections I have, and I like collecting things from the years gone by, whether it be news articles, whether it be things I've recorded on TV, whether it be books, media. And on the Kmart cassettes, I find that listening to the ads are just incredibly interesting, and I can understand why the next generation may find it very interesting because, you know, you're talking about cordless telephones that you hang on the wall, right? You're talking about answering machines. You're talking about brands of jeans and shoes that no longer exist. Ladies, your search is over. At last, there are jeans that fit you and your budget. Come on and try on a pair of chick jeans on sale now to help you stock up. Junior and missy sizes in three lengths for the comfort and look you want. You're talking about electronics that seem silly today, you know. 25-inch television, Zenith television on sale, that sort of thing. So I like the advertising from that aspect. And then a lot of the Kmart-related store advertisements, talking about if you need help, please find an associate. I mean, nowadays, you may find two people walking the entire sales floor. Retail stores don't train their associates to be specialists in any area. Back then, they did. There was curriculum. There were videos. So we knew how to, to do stuff in electronics or in the hardware department or auto. So anyways, it's just interesting when you hear about asking associates for things or no smoking allowed on the sales floor. Shoppers, many cities have local ordinances prohibiting smoking on the sales floor of a retail store. We ask that you cooperate by safely extinguishing all smoking materials in the containers provided at the entrance to the store. Thank you for not smoking. And I'm thinking, you know, around that time, there were certain states where you still could smoke in the store. And there were ashtrays. There were ashtrays when I started in 89 um, at the store that I worked at. 
and uh, went away, I think, in 1990. But anyways, the, the, the ads are very interesting, the nostalgia aspect, you know, and then you, you have the music on top of it. My favorite ads are the ones for the photo department with the character in those being named Dusty Lenscap. <laughs> yeah, there's Dusty Lenscap, the Kmart photo expert. And then there's Will Start, which was the Kmart auto service guy. And you'd have Will Start, and he started off with this car trying to start, you know, like, like a dead battery or, or car that wouldn't turn over all the way. But before batteries or, you know, picking up headlights, you, you know, you'd hear about that. And that's also when Kmart had auto service centers. Uh-huh. And when you posted the tapes, were you hoping to maybe connect with other Kmart employees who might have worked around that same time and had the same nostalgia you had? Not specifically. What I actually had a hard time doing was trying to find people that worked there currently or had worked there or I had worked with because I left in 1999 and I completely changed careers. I went into IT. Went back to school and such because I, I was a retail manager after I, I, I was an associate. I, I went to college but stayed in the management program and, and went around the various suburbs of Chicago. But um, it was 2015. And so I started shooting a couple emails. And, and at the time, I actually tried calling a couple people. And I was getting landlines for people that didn't exist. And so I really couldn't reach anyone. And there were a couple people on LinkedIn I did reach out to. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm wondering if you've heard about these Kmart cassettes. And, you know, I posted the link to the video and that. And most of them came back and said, no, I, I had no idea. I didn't know. So I, I wasn't able to connect with many people from Kmart. And I don't know, um, even to this day, it, it's difficult actually finding people, even though I do have a short list of friends that I used to work with there, and, and, you know, in my Facebook or social media. Uh-huh. Is it true that one of your fellow colleagues, who I think was a loss prevention officer, actually reached out to you about the tapes? Yeah, he was actually one, I want to say six months after this kind of went big, and this was a couple years after the video was on YouTube. But it was the video, you know, my video where I went through the cassettes initially, he um, posted a message saying, hey, this is Dan, your former loss control manager at store 3066 in, in Naperville. And he goes, I, I guess I didn't catch you taking the tapes. And he put like a smiley face and I think I messaged back and forth with him, but yeah, kind of funny. Gotcha. So one unexpected consequence of your collection going viral is that a lot of music makers have been inspired to sample it, remix it, and reconstitute it for their own music in a genre known as vaporwave. When did you first learn that that kind of repurposing was happening with your old tapes? So it was basically a couple months after the news articles and things started coming out. I was kind of in a honeymoon stage because I was searching the, the internet probably every day, maybe every other day, just to kind of see what was out there. And I started seeing traction on audio enthusiasts taking this music, remixing it, slowing the music down to a much lower speed, and then taking some of the commercials and such and, and putting reverb and some special effects and, and, and creating Vaporwave. And I didn't know it existed. And after looking into it, it wasn't something I ever considered or thought of. And I have a lot of different music types. Punk rock, I've got easy listening. I've got instrumentals. I've got 60s classic rock. I've also got rap music. I, I'm a music collector. That's a whole other thing I collect. But it was just surprising to me that I hadn't heard of it. But it's really only because it was like a subgenre that I think was coined in like 2012. And there were just a few artists that did it. And so this opened up the floodgates for this. And yeah, I'm not going to take credit, but I will say I think it had a strong influence to this whole genre, in addition to opening up a new aspect of history in Americana, if you will, something that's lost that I was able to preserve. So there were some other dynamics that came out of this. But the Vaporwave, um, I really couldn't get into. I just think it's interesting, and I've listened to a lot of it, but I would actually rather listen to the cassette tapes themselves. But, uh, you know, the more to it. I mean, people want to take it and do stuff. That's great. And there's, you know, Juicy the Emissary, he's a mixer or DJ or um, producer, he apparently has a bigger following. He took the material and made an entire album called Attention Kmart Shoppers. Attention. It 
it's on vinyl. I think it's on digital. But it was interesting because that had a lot of traction. Again, I just, I think it's great for nostalgia, but it's not the type of thing I'm going to put in my home stereo or my, my man cave and just crank up because I'm more of a crank up and let's make a playlist type of guy or in the car. Uh-huh. So you're not the godfather of Vaporwave. You're more like it's cool uncle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what's actually strange, I went to Wikipedia not that long ago. It'd be interesting if I actually had something on Wikipedia in Vaporwave that said Mark Davis contributed to this, doing this in 2015. But it didn't get to that level. But I will tell you, when you do the searching and you, you go even pages deep into my name with Kmart and cassettes and Vaporwave, you'll see a lot of this. So there's definitely demand out there. There's people into it. And when you're talking about people into it, you have to mention Tom Schwartzrock, a Kmart kindred spirit who reached out to Mark and supplemented Mark's archive with some digitized in-store audio from his own collection. Tom was interesting. He reached out to me on YouTube and he says, I have some Kmart reel-to-reels. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, I have a reel-to-reel deck, which I was digitizing tapes from when I was a kid because I played with a reel-to-reel deck. Plus, I was very familiar or in 1989, that service desk had a reel-to-reel deck. There was an old reel-to-reel, and and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, these are reels that were played on those. The company was called Tapathon that actually made the equipment, and they also made the programming, at least initially, through the 70s and 80s. But I reached out to him, and, and he worked at a Minnesota Kmart, probably in his 20s or maybe younger, but he had a couple reel-to-reel tapes from the 70s, as well as he had purchased specifically a Kmart reel-to-reel deck that was on an auction that had a, a reel on it, which was the May of 1988, which is one of the more popular ones. And it was the last one because, come to find out, the reason why that reel-to-reel he bought had May of 88. And I remember seeing a 1988 reel because it had a sticker on it behind the service desk. And I, I didn't take that reel. I should have taken it because I took all the cassettes but never took the reel. So he sent that to me, and then I digitized it. And um, I'd say if there's a tape, a favorite out of the entire collection, it's that May of 88, because it's got some really interesting mainstream renditions of music that are done like in the Muzak elevator format, which are extremely interesting. They're great renditions, and a lot of people will talk about, wow, I mean, this is, you know, we're hearing a Doors song, or we're hearing a Neil Diamond song. It's really interesting to hear the, the digitized or the instrumental version of it. So it was a high-quality reel-to-reel in terms of its content, but the reel itself was in pretty bad shape. Well, Mark to the rescue. It sounds like you you saved it from <laughs> total obscurity there. Yeah, so I, I should reach out to Tom and see, you know, I, I, if he has anything else. But I'm guessing there's very little that's out there. And if, if he didn't have it and he didn't buy that reel-to-reel with the tape on it from an auction on eBay, I, I'm sure they're, it's all in landfills. Uh-huh. So getting back to the online archive itself, I find it really funny that people actually leave reviews of specific tapes, and they're overwhelmingly positive. There's there's one I have here from someone named Buckflix, and they wrote, quote, I want to marry this. Uh, <laughs> that, that's from May 1991, by the way. Uh, another one for the February 1992 tape reads, This is the greatest thing ever. It's like a time machine dropped me in a depressing discount retail store in my formative years. Thank you for saving these and for sharing. <laughs> do you ever read these reviews? And There are a lot of them. I do read them. In fact, I get a notification from the Internet Archive every time there's a comment or a review. And um, I read almost each and every one of them, which means I've read a lot. And whether it be on the Internet Archive or through other sources or places out there, because there's a Reddit thread, too, I seriously, genuinely have not heard anybody say, this was crazy, this was stupid, why did you even, I mean, do this, other than the joking aspect, because overwhelmingly, the preservation and the nostalgia and the the praise is just incredible. I, I had no idea it would have this type of response. And a lot of those responses, people have taken time to detail out minute by minute what's on those tapes, where there's songs that are missing. There's people saying, hey, I'm looking for this song. Does anybody know what this song is? You know, it's not available on Shazam or no one's ever heard of it. 
And then others will just talk about a Kmart story or when they worked there. And it's a very warm feeling because when, when I was 16 working for Kmart, it was, it was a great experience. And so was working for them as a manager. But I, I got burned out. I got burned out of the long weeks and wanted to go into IT. But it brings me back to much simpler times. And it's, it's actually a very warm, comforting feeling thinking back of the days of simplicity when I was 16. Yeah. I'm guessing it's not so much nostalgia for the music itself, but for the shopping experience that, well, it hasn't gone away completely, but retail certainly isn't the same as it was back then. Yeah, it's a lot different. And um, I'd be hard pressed to find any retail store that's not playing hip, modern music. And out of fairness, it was around 1991 when the Tapathon branded programming and cassettes went to this company called Tower Sound and Communications. Um, once Tower took over, the tapes were weekly and they actually contained a lot of mainstream music. So somebody paid um, somewhere licensing, much more licensing than the other tapes to actually have mainstream artists. However, there was some instrumental, but uh, that was a, a change to more mainstream music which you hear today, and then probably 1992, 93 is, is when the satellite music delivery was put in place. And I'm sure now it's internet everywhere, but it was satellite. And that was different programming that was like completely mainstream. So it's like there's different generations. I, I captured the 1980s and early 90s. Tom captured a little bit of the 70s. And then, you know, you have satellite programming and, you know, whatever they did uh, till now, where there's only probably 25 Kmarts remaining, I think, in the country. So, bigger picture question for you. Uh, you worked at Kmart, you said, for 10 years. Do you think they got kind of a raw deal in the reputation department as being kind of low-end? They did. And I think a lot of it, you know, there's a lot of jokes that go back many years, you know, attention Kmart shoppers. And, and that alone doesn't make it, I guess, cheap. But the fact is, Kmart, I think in the 70s and 80s, always kind of positioned themselves as being kind of budget but I would disagree that Kmart had the best prices. And even in the 1990s and through the early 00s and until now, Kmart never has had great pricing when you compare it to Target, uh, when you compare it to Walmart. And of course, you know, today there's so many other online places, but it was expensive. So other than the fact it was expensive and I felt like we could have been cheaper. I do think Kmart got a bum rap because it was actually a very good company to work for. Had a lot of good products. Kmart was a big dog in the industry. It had all the, the big brands. It had everything in, from automotive to electronics to appliances. We had all the major brands, including house brands. I mean, a lot of retailers are going to have that anyways, but the fact is there wasn't anything substandard. I would have argued Zayer and Ames, which never were as big as Kmart, they were of extremely poor quality, a lot of the stuff that was sold. So I think Kmart was always kind of in the middle, but just couldn't struggle through the competition. Uh-huh. And I have to ask, did the joke in the movie Rain Man bug you? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 know that I know it, and I know it well. It's one of those things that a lot of people will uh, bring up to me when we talk. <laughs> Hello, Raymond. Did you feel a little more relaxed in your favorite Kmart clothes? Tell him, Ray. Kmart sucks. <laughs> I see. So, one last question for you. I know you still have the tapes, obviously. Do you still have the Kmart apron? I do. I have a couple aprons. <laughs> I have one that has pockets, and they realized that people were pocketing things. So then they have a vest, and there were a couple different versions of the vest. And then you also have one if you were in the garden shop. So I have all of mine in good condition for posterity. But the mullet is gone? Yeah, the mullet's gone. <laughs> that was gone in about 1994. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, that's everything I've got for you. I want to thank you for hitting the rewind button for me and revisiting your Kmart tape collection once more on my behalf. This has been fun. Well, thank you, David. It's uh, been a pleasure talking to you, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, continue sharing the story and to keep the facts out there as to what this is all about. Yeah, it's endlessly fascinating. The viral part, all of it. Well, excellent. Much appreciated. Thanks again. Well, Mark's story of preserving the in-store cassette tapes from his early days at Kmart was like Muzak to my ears. And there's a certain amount of poetic justice in that every now and then, 
Mark is asked to talk publicly about his Kmart tapes yet again. It's not unlike those looping cassette tapes he endured and grew to love back when he was a sales associate. And while Kmart's days as a physical brand appear to be numbered, the sounds of shopping at Kmart, captured in all their lo-fi glory in Mark's collection, will live on. For Keeps is a production of me, David Peterkovsky. My thanks to Mark Davis for sharing his story of going viral with his unusual collection of Kmart in-store cassette tapes. At ForKeepsPodcast.com, you'll find a photo of Mark in his Kmart heyday, as well as some images of the tapes themselves. The show's theme song is by Still Flyin', and the closing theme is by Eric Frisch. Additional music for this episode was provided by Infomercial USA, Chris Zabriskie, and Das Bomb. You can visit the show online at ForKeepsPodcast.com or follow For Keeps on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at For Keeps Podcast. And if you like the show, how about giving it a boost by posting a positive review of it wherever you get your podcasts? Those reviews help bring more and more listeners to the show. So if you haven't submitted one yet, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to For Keeps. Until next time, keep on keeping on.